Is this normal to vaccinate people who are not at risk of a disease to protect other people? Is, is that normally done? No, it, this is the first time it's been suggested. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. A fascinating guest we have for you today. He is a consultant oncologist. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Buckingham. And most important of all, a returning guest to the show. Dr. Karas Sikora, welcome back. Thank you very much. It's so good to have you back on the show. It's been about a year since we last had you on to talk about lockdown and COVID, and we didn't really get into vaccines, I think, much at the time. What have you made of the last year and everything that's been going on? Well, it's been fairly fast paced, not what I expected. I mean, going into lockdown and when it began was easy. It was easy for the politicians. It was easy for those that implemented it. Getting out is much more complex. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing the tail end of getting out of it. And, you know, the ridiculous business of the different four countries having different rules within the UK. And, uh, and yet, anyone can travel between them. So the rules are sort of nonsense, basically. But I think now we're in a very good position. The number of hospital admissions has fallen, the number of cases has fallen, and we seem to be getting out of the third wave. The, the pessimists, the gloomy boys say, mm. and girls say, what about the fourth wave? And you know, if, if there is anything, it'll just be a little blip. That's my reading of the situation. But what about winter? Surely there's going to be another peak in winter. And I don't say this as someone who's in any way desperate for that to happen. It's more that I think it's been a year and a half of, of these constant expectations. And you're, you're known for your positivity. Of course you are. And I think last time we talked, you were hopeful that this would be over by previous January. But that hasn't transpired. So the concern for, I think, for everybody is that as winter comes, there will be pressures, whether they're COVID or not, there's always pressure on the NHS. And the feeling, I think, is given the public sentiment, which I find <laughs> difficult to explain, frankly, at this point, uh, we will be in another lockdown. Don't you think that that's likely? Well, if it was due to COVID, yes, but it's not likely to be due to COVID. It's likely to be due to other viruses mm. and secondary pneumonia. It happens every winter. You know, I was a medical student many, many years ago. And when I came out of the book work and went to the wards, the first year there was a flu epidemic and it was chaos. The whole wards, no routine operations, everything canceled because of flu. And mainly elderly patients got a bit of an infection with the virus and then they got secondary pneumonia and some of them ended up on ventilators. So, and that happens every year. We call it winter pressures in the NHS. It's a euphemism. No other country has winter pressures. It's a, it's a failure to have the capacity to deal with it. Uh, and therefore, you have to shut down services such as routine uh, non-urgent surgery to make beds, to make facilities available, to make intensive care available for those that need it because of the infection. So will we actually get coronavirus causing a problem in the winter? Uh, perhaps in a small way, but it's much more likely there are a whole row of other things coming along, flu, other coronaviruses that will dominate and cause the winter pressures. And of course... Well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm just... Uh, you, you, you're positive that this is the tail end of it. it but I, I, do, should, people, should people be positive about it? I think they should. We've got to learn to live with this. We can't have this nonsense just this week about traveling. I mean, you know, either you go for it and you say, that's it, we're, we're opening things up, or you, you don't. Well, you can't suddenly say, oh, this country's just become red on Sunday. And so unless you get back by Sunday, you're, you're stuck. And this is Mexico, where there's quite a lot of tourists have gone. Uh, and these people are desperate. I mean, you know, it costs an awful lot to organize your own trip home for, for, on a commercial airliner. So, and they don't get any help from their existing provider of transport. So I think it's that sort of thing that's really irritating. We've got to come out of it in a smooth way instead of a sort of uh, a, a jagged way, which leaves bad taste. And then the rest of society, you know, there's lots of illogicality. I mean, the, the biggest one, I was in Wales yesterday, uh, day before yesterday. Mm. Wales has different rules. So they're still 
with masks everywhere, with uh, social distancing. Uh, no one's enforcing it, but they, 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 they have that rule. So I went to a little restaurant for a curry with a colleague, and uh, you had to wear a mask to go from the door. It's a tiny little place, no bigger than the studio here. And uh, you had to wear a mask to go through the door. You sat down, you take the mask off. And it, this has seemed ridiculous that, you know, for 10 yards you wore a mask, then you took it off. And the, obviously the staff all wore masks. So, it's these sort of rules that are not based on any real science that seem to be still lingering and will probably linger way until Christmas as people still don't get totally relaxed about the virus, basically. Do you sometimes worry, Carol, that with the lockdowns, we've opened the Pandora's box? So you say that every winter the NHS comes under pressure because of capacity. The government's going to say, right, well, the NHS, we need to protect the NHS, let's shut everything down again. That certainly is a worry, that you use the experience of the last year, anything that comes along, whether it's winter or not, you say, oh, let's shut down again, and you do a dramatic shutdown. The other way is to say, let's expand the NHS, expand healthcare, mm. not necessarily in, in the same form as we've got it now, and develop places that people can go that have chest infections. And, uh, you know, when you look at it, the problem we've got, you've got hospitals, which are expensive, £500 a night for a bed in a hospital anywhere in the country because of the staff costs. Uh, and you've got care homes which have no medical care, no qualified nurses usually. Maybe the, the head, head person there is a nurse, but on the whole, they have no medical facilities and they don't want to they're commercial they're all private and uh, so that there's only two choices what we need is a third choice in the middle for older people they can go there and they can get medical care of a, a light version not intravenous strips and not ventilators and things but they can stay there and be looked after whilst they get better it well enough to go to the care home with no medical care so it's a matter of it's called uh, you know step down accommodation but we just don't really have any in this country who runs it the nhs or the private sector it really doesn't matter and it could be free at the point of delivery so that's the key to it all care homes are not free of course and this some people get them free, but you have to have very little money. If, you, if you've got a house, you're going to have to pay for your care home. So that's the problem. And Carol, we're talking about the NHS. Um, it seems that the NHS, as long as I've been alive, we've been talking about how it's in crisis. But it does seem to be in crisis at the moment, particularly when you look at waiting lists, particularly when you look at the effects that COVID has had on the NHS. I think the, the reason COVID is Pinged on our healthcare system compared to other European systems is simply capacity. You know, waiting lists and rationing have, have been there. I've been a consultant 40 years and we've had it all the time. And, uh, you know, just to get an MR scan, a, a magnetic resonance scan, if you've got backache or a knee problem, or even if you've got sort of weight, weight loss and abdominal pain, it can take six months and everyone accepts it. And so, whereas in, in France, you go within two days, you'd have the scan. There's the capacity in the system, which we don't have. So building up that capacity is clearly something that we can learn from COVID. And, and it, it came suddenly. And of course, nobody really knows how many people are on the waiting list. It's amazing. The figures vary. There's probably more than the government figures, 5.3 million at the moment, but there's almost certainly more if you take everything, including scans and, and blood tests and so on. And, and we sort of accepted a very sluggish system, uh, GP hospital. And the GP, to get to see your GP can take six weeks now. So just imagine you've got a, you know, you, you may have cancer and you have to wait six weeks before you start. Then you get to the GP, then you have to have a blood test. You wait two weeks for that. Then you get referred for an MR scan. You wait another six weeks or even two months, for, even for an urgent one. So it's all that waiting that we have here that other countries have avoided by having more capacity. And why is that, Carol? Because, you know, the people on the left go, it's a funding problem. The people on the right go, you know, the fact that the NHS is bloated, it's misspending. What is the truth? It's, it's between the two. It is underfunded for what could be achieved with modern medicine. It's also challenged by old people. 
people older than me. That's my definition of an old person. <laughs> and uh, uh, people older than me are big consumers of it, and mm. they, of all of it, from GP to hospital care and so on. And often there's not much health systems can do for old people. They're just, they have chronic comorbidities mm. and uh, uh, generally body crumble. And, uh, you know, you, you're stuck with that. Mm. Uh, for younger people, it's episodic care, which is what they want. You have to define procedure for doing something for this hernia or uh, you know, cataracts and so on. You get that done. The problem we've got is that the NHS is also a political tool. And it's very much bloated with middle management that want to be politically correct. And for example, uh, two months ago, I had to do my yearly appraisal. And to do that, you have to do mandatory training online. And it, it involves all sorts of things, uh, you know, uh, courses on fire extinguishers. Well, I can, I can see the use of a fire <laughs> extinguisher, of course, yeah. in, just in case, I, yeah. I can see that. But, uh, you know, to have to learn about equality and diversity, I understand the problems of equality and diversity, but, you know, to spend an hour going through it, I mean, in, in, a, in a sort of almost religious, and I was brought up as a Roman Catholic, so I'm used to catechismic learning, where people tell you this is what you have to do, uh, and this is the right way. And so you have to go through all that, and someone has to supervise it. And ironically, most of these training courses are outsourced to the private sector. So it's, it's almost ridiculous that we all have to do this. But I think throughout the NHS, there's a sort of a cult of a religion there. Mm. And you know, we saw it with the banging of spoons in COVID. And that's a sort of almost a religious act that you're praising your priests, the high priests of the NHS. And, uh, you know, you can say well, what people are praising, of course, is the, the medical nursing mm. staff. They're not praising the structure. And that's the problem. They have to dissociate that and try and move forward. And uh, you talk about the priest class, which I think is actually a very important conversation, but there's been another area in which I feel that that's been happening, which you alluded to earlier, which is this notion that every restriction that we that has been imposed on the country, every decision that's been made, it's all been following the science, which is a phrase that irritates me massively because from what I know about the science, both my parents are scientists, the science is about discussion and debate and different points of view and testing hypotheses and sometimes being wrong and being able to admit it. Um, the, the idea that the science has one particular view is it, it, frankly absurd, yet that has been the messaging. What have you made of that? I think we've seen the politicians on one side trying to implement the advice they're getting from committees and SAGE is the main committee, uh, but there are little subcommittees. and. Uh, it's very difficult. I mean, the committees work, they take the data and maybe 20 people on SAGE on the committee, obviously just doing it virtually. And so you get one or two people that are very negative and want to have, you know, severe lockdown, uh, vaccinate everybody, including babies, all this sort of stuff. Everyone has to wear masks everywhere. Mm. And uh, so they tend to dominate the thinking of the group. So it's called groupthink, and they, they convert people. I mean, everyone wants the committee to come to an end, so you have to get some sort of consensus. And so the consensus tends to go with the severest option, goes down. If you remove two or three people that are doing that, you'd have a much more balanced view. Are you tired of using bulky old wallets, giving you a bulge where you don't want it to be? My old wallet was massive, so it brought all the ladies to the yard, which was a huge distraction and got in the way of my esteemed work on trigonometry. Ridge wallets have an incredible solution for you. This is mine, sleek, stylish, and with an industrial look to it. It can fit 12 cards with cash on the back using a clip like this one or a strap. We've got one for the whole team. I've got one, Francis has one, even our producer Anton has one, but he's from Liverpool, so he flogged his on the black market. The great thing about Ridge is that they give you a lifetime guarantee, which means if you want, you can have only one wallet for the rest of your life. Ridge are so confident in the quality of their product, they will give you 45 days to test drive their wallets. 
That means you can get the wallet, use it, and if you don't like it, you can return it within 45 days. Because Ridge is such great guys, they're gonna give you 10% off and free worldwide shipping and returns. To take advantage of this incredible offer, go to ridge.com forward slash trigger. That's ridge.com forward slash trigger and use our special code, which is of course, trigger. The other beef I've got about it is the data is not disclosed. So great example last week, um, vaccinating 16 and 17-year-olds. So, okay, it's a valid point. If the risk of getting COVID would lead to more illness than vaccination, provided it doesn't cause a lot of side effects, it, it would be justified. But, you, you know, where's the data? Show us how you've come to that conclusion. And there was nothing. This was a, commit, a subcommittee called the Joint Committee of Vaccines and Immunization. And, you know, it's been around for years and they've looked at how to do schedules for mumps and for measles and polio and so on. Now they're stuck with COVID. And uh, immunizing the 16 and 17 year olds it's a valid point, but let's see the risk benefit analysis. Mm. And it's not public. And uh, so we don't really know. So all these GPs are gonna have to go out and collect up the 16 to 17 year olds and, and shoot them up with vaccine uh, without really knowing if it's, if the risks of the vaccine outweigh the risks of getting COVID because they're not a group that get ill with COVID on the whole. They get COVID, but not. And, you know, the, the, the ethics... Well, well, Carol, that's not good, is it? The GPs are going to be vaccinating people without, without really data. knowing whether it, the, the risk is worth it. I, I, that's not a good thing, is it? Yeah. It, it? You know, I've asked them to publish the data, but they, they won't. And, you know, one suspects the data are mu uh, muddy because, you know, the vaccine, and it's only the Pfizer vaccine that's going to be allowed. So the, the, the Pfizer vaccine is probably the best studied of the vaccines because mm. it was the trials in the States and in S South America were right at the very beginning. And they included young people, including children. So Carol, you, sorry, can I just interrupt? Yeah. Why is it they're only going to give the Pfizer vaccine to the kids and not the AstraZeneca? Okay, so the AstraZeneca don't, doesn't go to anybody below 40 at the moment. And the reason is that the AstraZeneca has a side effect profile, which is age related. In other words, if you're over 40, you don't get the side effects. If you're under 40, the side effects on the heart and on the lungs are more severe with, with the, the vaccine. All vaccines have you know, severe side effects, but in very small numbers of people. Even polio has side effects. Uh, the polio vaccine. The, the polio vaccine has side effects. And, uh, and yet, the, but it's very low and the consequences of polio are very bad for a child. They, they, get, yeah. they can be paralyzed. Mm. And, uh, um, you know, when I was a, a youngster, you could see people that had polio. They were limping around with a bad leg and calipers and so on. That's all gone from society because of the vaccine. But coming back to SARS, the problem there is that you're going to immunize an age group that really is not troubled by the infection right. if they get it. Very few are going to be in hospital, very few are going to be on a ventilator. So the ethicists love the situation because they say one of the reasons they want to vaccinate kids is because you're protecting the older people. So you're vaccinating, you're putting at risk a young person so an older person can live. Well, the older person's now been double vaccinated, so why should this help? I mean, it's a, in a logical area. And that's why it would be good to see the data on these sort of decisions. Other countries have the same mess. I mean, it's not just us. Sure. So uh, the United States, everybody over 12 is being offered the vaccine. And the data is just not there for that. Carol, what do you make of this? Because it's not something that Francis or I know about. And these are real questions that I think a lot of people will want to hear the answer to. Is this normal to vaccinate people who are not at risk of a disease to protect other people? Is, th is that normally done? No. It, this is the first time it's been suggested. Really? And, and that's why I'd be very keen to see the data. Forget the protection business. See what's the risk-benefit analysis on, on the patient, on, on, on the child, on the 16-year-old. What benefit do they get? I mean, you know, the story is all, well, it's September's coming up, and they're going to go back to school or back to college, mm -hmm. and the, you know, boys and girls at 16 to 17, social distancing is not part of their agenda, and they'll go dancing and so on, so they need protection. But if the risk is greater 
than the, the benefit, we shouldn't be doing it. And so that's the sort of analysis you want to see. Right. And you know, it's all right saying this is our conclusion, accept it without the data. Well, that's wrong. We should be able to see the data. But it's, it's never been done. What about smallpox? Didn't that get eradicated by the vac vaccinating it everybody? It did. And smallpox was a great... Smallpox and polio are the best success stories ever because they were lethal diseases. You know, the story of smallpox vaccination goes back nearly 300 years. Right. And uh, cowpox, it was noted by Jenner, uh, the, the, Edward Jenner, the founder of vaccinology, really, that the milkmaids that had the cowpox didn't get smallpox. There was a cross reaction. And so he went around vaccinating people. Vaca comes from the word cow, Latin, I think way back from my O-level days. <laughs> so taking the cowpox and put it, scratching it into the arms of not milkmaids, but everybody. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, what was fascinating about Jenner, 20 years before, there was a guy called Benjamin Jesty. He wasn't a medic. He was a farmer in Yetminster, and, uh, which is a small village uh, in Somerset. And he did the same thing with his family and others around him. And so he was, but he got no credit for it. He's got a blue plaque on his house because I've been there, the <laughs> farmhouse he had. Uh, but he got no credit for it. Jenner got the credit because he was a physician. His portrait's up in the Royal College of Physicians, whereas uh, our friend Benjamin Jesty was just the blue plaque on his farmhouse. Mm. So, but no, the whole business of vaccination is fascinating because you're taking normal, they're not patients. They're right. People that are normal, as we are the three of us sitting in the studio. Uh, and so you're going to do an intervention that must, by definition, carry risks yes. for their benefit. Can you do the same thing for other people's benefit? And that's that's the question you're really so That's asking. what I'm getting at, because to me, I, look, I'm not a medical ethicist, but the ethics of that surely are questionable, aren't they? Th they are. And so that's why the data from JCVI on how, what benefit, what's the risk benefit to the person you're vaccinating, forget what benefit on the population? And is there not another way? I mean, if, 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 a, if, if a 16 year old it could do social distancing from his grandparents, for example, mm. I and mean, there's other ways of protecting the grandparents. And, you know, if the, one of the problems of the whole immunization business is voluntary, there's no compulsion. Mm. And it's the same for childhood vaccination, mm. I mean, as you know, with Andrew Wakefield and all that data about autism and vaccines. A lot of people stopped immunizing their kids. And that has led to an increase in the number of ch children with measles and, and mumps and uh, um, rubella and things like that, because parents have just avoided getting vaccination. That's sort of disappearing now. With this, uh, it's giving vaccination a bad name for the reasons you just suggested. That if you can't see the data, why are we doing it? it and it's a very, very, very good point. And you were saying that, you know, we don't coerce people into taking vaccines. We're kind of doing it now, aren't we, Carol? Well, it's a very clever game. You know, I think there's some very smart people in number 10 that are sitting there looking at the, how to persuade people to be vaccinated. And these are guys that have been to top universities, they're very bright, and they've come up with this idea that what we do, we just drip it in. We don't say vaccine passports are going to be compulsory, we just drip it in, and then you remove it. But because you're dripping it in and the PR comes out, you're going to have to have a vaccine passport. I mean, how is it really going to be implemented? A vaccine passport to go in the in the pub at the end of the road. Who's going to check it? Who's going to be able to validate that what you're showing is yours and all the rest of it? It's much more complex. Crossing international borders is easy because you've got trained people that can look at documents, you can um, insist on various things, but going down to the king and queen at the end of the road, that's not the real pub. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a, a different level. So I think that you know, the smart guys in number 10 have got a plan that you just keep going with it. People then get vaccinated uh, and then you, you remove the need for any certification because you, you succeed in. The great thing about all vaccines, you don't need to do the whole population. If you do 80%, that's good enough. And of course, we're already at about 80% immunity because a lot of people have COVID. So you've got the infected, and you've got the vaccinated people, and both of them will have immunity. And so that stops the spread, so it reduces the R number of, the, of, of spread. Well, 
let's go into the whole vaccine passport thing. But Francis, sorry, just one thing. I know I've been hogging the mic. I just wanted to say one thing on that particular issue, which is the counter argument to everything you've said that we, we keep hearing, and I'd love for you to address this, is the idea that if there's a small unvaccinated population, then that will be the breeding ground for new variants, which will then reinfect the, and, and sabotage the whole program. What do you make of that argument? I think that's unlikely simply because uh, if you destroy the roots of communication, transmission for the virus, you destroy the, the chances of a mutant getting out into the immune people. There's very little evidence that once you're vaccinated, you're going to get infected, even with mutants. So if a mutant arises an unvaccinated patient, uh, unvaccinated uh, people, it's unlikely that it can transmit back to your immune population. Hold on, aren't we seeing people in hospital with COVID having been double jabbed now? A few, but it's mainly people that haven't been double jabbed that go into hospital. That the serious illness is prevented by the vaccines, and right. that, there's no doubt. What's not prevented by the vaccine necessarily is the is the transmission, especially in, after just one jab. But on the whole, the vaccinated population protects the unvaccinated population. So there is again this sort of uh, you know it's it's a strange business. Um, and if you look at it's we've never had it before because if you look at things like polio that doesn't the, the vaccines are perfect compared to SARS vaccine which is not perfect it's you know 80% effective so 20% you're getting no benefit for so that's the trouble with it all and people play around with those numbers i mean you know i'm not an immunologist but i know enough to understand that it's so to say, well, the Pfizer vaccine is 95% effective. Well, what does that really mean? Uh, you'd really love to do the experiment. You get 100 people, you give them the shot, and then you infect them deliberately. <laughs> and you see who, how many get it. Then you take another 100 people, no vaccine, shoot them up, you know, and they, they all get it. And, and that's the number you really want to do the comparison. But that would be a, an unethical experiment. So going back to the idea of vaccine passports, there's a lot of people who will say that those people are putting others at risk yeah. in an event, in a concert, et cetera, et cetera. We can't have them in that area. This is how we protect people. Do you agree with that argument? No. I think you can do it alternatively. You can do testing. We've got very good rapid tests now, uh, lateral flow tests, which, sure, there's false positives, there's false negatives, but they're really not bad. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be enough to gain your entrance to Wembley or some big event. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. I noticed that in an advert for cruising. I've never been on a cruise and I never want to go on a cruise, by the <laughs> way. Uh, Saga Cruises, and it said... Everyone has to be vaccinated. So it was in the advert for the cruise. It said vaccine people only or something mm -hmm. like that. And that's an interesting, exactly what you say. People feel more secure if everyone's been vaccinated on the boat. But it's much better to test everybody as they go onto the boat. The trouble with that is what do you do? People, you're at Southampton docks and someone tests positive. You're stuck. They've got to take their luggage back. They've got to go. They'll be really very distraught about the situation. So that is the problem with testing. But you could test before they leave the house. I mean, there's ways of doing it. And there are lots of, around the corner from your studio, there's a place that says testing, same day service. And you know, everywhere you can get these things. Well, wouldn't you agree as well, Carol, that the introduction of vaccine passports, or the threatened introduction of vaccine passports, actually heightened suspicion amongst people who are, who are worried about the vaccine. It, it does. And that's why mandatory, making it mandatory is probably the wrong approach. Now, a lot of arguments within healthcare, whether you can make mandatory vaccination of staff. And that is a really difficult issue. And we were all very privileged to be offered vaccination right at the beginning. I got mine the first week of January. I went round to Hammersmith, my old hospital, and uh, eight o'clock in the morning, coffee in a bun and shoot up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so we, but there are a group of people that just don't want it. Whatever reason, they just don't want it. Now, can you insist that they don't work frontline with patients? Mm -hmm. If they're going to insist on that, what use are they to you? Because if they can't, a nurse can't be on a ward, what are you going to do? Make her an administrator or something? I mean, there's not that many roles for, for people that are 
you know, frontline clinical to go behind because they won't be vaccinated. So much better to try and persuade them to be vaccinated or to, you know, does it really matter? that, that It's back to following the science mm. that you mentioned, yeah. Constantine. We don't have the... We don't really know if a small percentage, say 10% of your staff are not vaccinated, are they going to be a, a problem in dealing with patients? Because obviously patient safety is paramount in any healthcare system. Care home is the same. And so can you immunise all the staff to prevent them being a, a route of transmission? And I think you can persuade them to be without making it compulsory. Do you think it's illogical for people to be fearful of this vaccine? I'll give you an example. My girlfriend's 32 years old. She had the AstraZeneca. It's now said that you should be over the age of 40 to have AstraZeneca. There's countries that have said that banned AstraZeneca for a certain period of time. Is it, what, is it logical for people to be concerned about this vaccine and not want to take it if you're looking at the science and the data? I think the AstraZeneca has a different toxicity profile, side effect profile, mm. than the Pfizer. Uh, on the other hand, it's a much more established way of making a vaccine, taking a, a, another virus and coupling it up with some proteins that it expresses mm. to make it look as though it's a SARS virus to the immune system. Mm. Uh, the Pfizer is just a little bit of RNA, which is the message that DNA makes protein with. And so you, you're, it's a sort of genetic engineering, if you like. You're putting a gene, an artificial gene in the arm, which is going to turn over proteins that, again, convince the immune system you've already been infected and therefore develop a powerful resistance if you do get exposed to the virus. So, you know, the side effect profiles are different. And what's emerged in the clinical trials is that the Pfizer seems to have less side effects in younger people than the AstraZeneca, and that's the reason for the age cutoff. Other countries have made it 60 rather than 40, so Scandinavian countries won't give AstraZeneca under 60 to try and avoid this. And the most serious problems are in the heart, the brain, and the lung. And the, it's inflammation, it's non-specific inflammatory change. Um, in most cases it's transient, it, you know, two or three weeks it gets better. But in some, it doesn't, and that's, that's the worry. And there have been deaths, but there are deaths with both vaccines. The real trouble with relating anything to a vaccine is, you know, people are primed when they get the vaccine. Anything that goes wrong, they blame the vaccine. Mm. And, uh, and it may have happened anyway, and you can't separate that. Then how do you convince these people who are worried, of which, I'll be honest with you, I am one of them. Yeah. Because, I, like you said, I, I saw the way that they changed continually. I, and I, I was thinking at one point, do I take the AZ? Oh, I can't take the AZ. How do you convince people then? What but is also, the... Francis, you've had COVID, right? Yeah, and I've had, but I've had yeah. COVID. So I think to myself, should I take it? Should I not take it? I've had COVID, I, see, I was fine with it, I felt rough for a week, but then I got over it. Do I need the vaccine? The answer is, Francis, nobody knows what to advise an individual. And that's where we are, that we can't advise an individual. We can look at the whole population mm -hmm. and look at the, the benefit in terms of preventing COVID-related illness, and then including long COVID, and then we can look at the uh, the, the risks of having the vaccine. And they're, in someone of your age, they're relatively small, whether it's AstraZeneca or fine, they're, they're almost trivial. But if you do get bad side effects, they're not going to be trivial, and that's the problem. Uh, so uh, the advice for populations is get immunised. How we persuade people, I mean, I think it's crazy persuading people by giving monetary offerings, you know, $100 in the States and so on, or a Big Mac. Have a Big Mac. <laughs> this seems counterintuitive as a health uh, gift yeah. to have, yeah. uh, with chips, of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and a nice fizzy, fizzy high-calorie drink to yeah. go with it. So uh, bribing people doesn't work. They have to understand. And I think the other thing we've not spent enough time on is work out why people are scared, what, what the reasons for it. But, you know, it's still very sad. There are families that don't, the mothers won't let their kids have polio, for example, mm. vaccination. And that, that seems a little strange in the modern world, but people have different beliefs. And I guess my training within the NHS for diversity is means you have to encompass all beliefs and uh, not force things through. I mean, in a sense, lockdown 
uh, was forced through. Although our lockdown in the UK was very light compared with a lot of other countries mm. which uh, used police in a, and military in a much more aggressive way to keep people, you know, that you got shot if you came to the door, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, you know, you were certainly accosted to, to know why you were moving around, whereas here it was, yeah, it was almost voluntary. And you, you talk about the, the lockdowns and the sort of various measures. Uh, have you been concerned by the the government's willingness to coerce people into doing things, whether that's, you know, taking the vaccine or, or, or whatever other measures that, that, that they're encouraging? It, it, the thing that's really concerned me about it is is the willingness of the government in a free society to use, you know, Boris Johnson saying, oh, well, if you want to enjoy life, you're going to have to get the... To me, that that's... It's quite a forceful way of doing things, isn't it? it yeah, you know, I really don't like it. Civil liberty is really important. Mm. And uh, we've seen that go a bit. But as I say, the UK has not been the worst country. Mm. Uh, we, we call these interventions MPIs, non-pharmacological intervention. It's not a vaccine, it's not a drug. Uh, it's social distancing, it's mask wearing, and it's lockdown. I mean, avoiding crowds, shutting restaurants, shutting all these things. And, it, and, you know, all these rules, these bubbles, I never understood the bubbles and <laughs> why restaurants wouldn't take more than six people because otherwise you'd be breaking the rules. I, I just couldn't get my head around those. And again, they varied in Wales and, and London and Glasgow and so on. So the, the enforcement is not easy. And, it, you know, I felt sorry for the police. I mean, they, they were trying to enforce it. And now and again, you get some heavy-handed, you know, episodes happening. A couple of ladies walked around a reservoir somewhere and they got arrested and fined for having a cup of coffee there. And, and that sort of thing is it's bad taste. And, uh, you know, I remember seeing a picture of a, a roadblock somewhere in the West Country and they were looking in the boot to see if you'd been shopping. You had to show your shopping. But you know, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, it's, uh, uh, so, I, I, and I, I think that's been the problem, um, that no one wants it. And I think you have to persuade people that vulnerable people need to be, you know, older people, people with or existing chest disease, who, if they do get COVID, are going to get it bad, they should avoid restaurants, they should just not go out. But you and me, we can go out because we're healthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the sort of way I'd look at it. What do you make of the counter argument to that, that people make very often because, you know, the conversation the three of us are having here is not representative of the public mood of the, of the polls are to be believed, right? So the, the counter argument that people often make is, well, you talk about your civil liberties, Carol, but actually by being in a restaurant, let's say me and Francis, who both had COVID but haven't had the vaccine, yeah. uh, you are denying me my civil liberty to be in a restaurant because I have to be afraid for my health. What about that argument? That's, Isn't that that's a reasonable a, way of looking at it? It's, it's a very interesting point. And, you know, I travel in from the suburbs from where I live and I come on the train and to, I don't wear a mask, but nearly everyone else is wearing a mask, I've noticed. Mm. now. Why are they wearing a mask? Some of them probably think they're protecting themselves. Mm. That's, that's a misconception, but, but they want to believe it's protecting them, they feel better with it, why not let them do it? Mm. Others think it's their civil duty. And in fact, on the, on the railway sign, it says, please be considerate, wear a mask. Uh, it would help if you wear a mask in crowded places. How do you define a crowded place? You know, Obviously, London Underground has been crowded throughout this whole thing. Mm. And the central line is particularly bad. And a lot of people have never worn a mask on that. So uh, it's, it, it's a very difficult issue. And again, it's civil liberties. Do what you want. The, the other thing that's fascinating that very few people seem to be aware is the exemption. And uh, the exemption is just ridiculous. Anyone can be exempt. You don't have to go to a doctor. Or you don't have to go anywhere. You just can phone up or email Transport for London and they'll send you a badge. I mean, it is, uh, and you can cut one out from the website and you can declare yourself exempt. I mean, it, it's, it's just crazy. Uh, and there are all these inconsistencies in, in the whole system. And I think, you know, the business that you, you, even during the beginning of lockdown, we allowed people to walk a dog. So well, this is just, either you have lockdown or you don't. They allow people to go shopping. You allow, you know, other countries didn't, you know, they, they'd be, my granddaughter lives in Peru, 
Mm. And the story she tells, well, obviously it's a bit of a military police state there, uh, and they do have a serious problem with COVID. And there you walked out and police would come and find you and take you back and, uh, you know, go and tell, tell your parents off. It's a different system. Hey, Francis, do you want to learn another language? No, mate, I'm English. If foreigners can't understand me, I just shout at them. Think about it, you could learn how to say penalties in Italian. Leave it. But if you do want to learn another language because maybe you want to have new experiences, live in another country, or maybe you just want to open your mind. My mind's open enough. If I open it up any further, my brain's gonna hurt. This is true. But Babbel's 15 minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. They design their courses with practical real world conversations in mind. Sentences you will use in normal everyday life. Sentences like, Oi Pedro, dos cervezas por favor. Thank you, Francis. And Babel's courses have been proven to be scientific. <laughs> and Babel's courses have been proven to be scientifically effective across multiple studies. Their 15 minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. It's available as an app or online, and your progress will be synced across all devices. You can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. They've also got their own podcast, so you can brush up on your French and Spanish on the go. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. And before you know it, tú vas a poder hablar español absolutamente perfecto. No, I mean Gary. Right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months free with a purchase of a six-month subscription with our promo code, which is, of course, Trigger. Go to uk.babbel.com slash play and use promo code Trigger for an extra six months free. That's uk.babbel.com forward slash play promo code Trigger. The civil liberty side always worries me. But what also worries me is the effect that this has had on cancer patients. And stopping the system for lockdown, what, has it, what effect has that had on you and your department and the cancer departments across the country? Huge effect. And that was one of, the, one of the reasons I got a Twitter account, was to point this out right at the beginning, that cancer patients are going to suffer here. I mean, what happened way back in April 2020, um, so more than a year ago, was suddenly the whole system's ground to a halt. So you couldn't go and see your GP. The GP couldn't refer you to the hospital. You couldn't get even a chest X-ray was difficult to arrange. Even if you were coughing up blood, you couldn't get a chest X-ray which would diagnose tuberculosis or lung cancer. Wow. So even if I presented at the GP and saying, look, I'm physically coughing up blood, which is a classic sign of lung cancer. Yeah, yeah. The, you, nothing would happen. And there's a good paper in the British Medical Journal pointing that out, that people with hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood in medical terms, uh, were ignored in April and May. And the, the, the best evidence there was a serious problem was looking at the number of biopsies for cancer. So biopsy is putting a needle somewhere and taking a sample. And that's how you know someone's got cancer. It's the only way you can really tell. I mean, x-rays and scans do help you, but it doesn't, it's not convincing that that really is cancer. The, shadow, the abnormal shadow is a cancer. So biopsy level, the number of biopsies per day should be around 1,000 every day. So, uh, and you look at the numbers, they dropped to about 50 during April and to about 200 in May. And then they gradually came up as the year went on. But even now, access to certain services are limited because, uh, you know, if you've got a waiting list of 5 million, probably more, in there, there are cancer patients that don't know they've got cancer, nor do the doctors know they've got cancer. But once whatever the procedure they're waiting for is done, cancer will be diagnosed. I've got a couple of questions for you on, on that particular issue. The first one, again, the counter argument to what you're saying is, well, look, if we didn't do a lockdown, if we didn't take all these measures, the NHS would have been overwhelmed and you still have a massive backlog, but also loads of people are dying of COVID. Isn't, didn't we need to do all of that to just stop the system from collapse? I would say no. Uh, it was finely balanced, especially with the second wave, but uh, and this wave there's no effect. I mean, the number of people going into hospitals not flooding it at all. 
the second wave was a bit different and the, 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 it was getting close. Now, the other interesting thing is how difficult it is to predict what's going to happen at any point in time with this. So it's very easy to look back and say, oh, we should have done this, we should have done that. But at the time, you couldn't work out where the curves were going. And the government's politicians are easily swayed by extreme views, extremely negative views about where it's going. You know, the one thing that was quite amazing, and what a waste of money it was, were the Nightingale hospitals. Mm -hmm. I mean, building these places, like one close to here in Excel in London, and no one seemed to give any thought to where the staff were coming from. Where are you mm -hmm. going to get the people? They're in the hospitals. They're busy. They've got jobs to do. And uh, what, you're going to get, getting retired doctors, retired nurses. You know, some of my friends signed up for that. My wife signed up. She's a nurse, but they never got used. And quite frankly, they would need to be retrained. In you know, in, in, if you're doing intensive care in Excel, you'd have to be retrained to do it. You couldn't just take old people. Like my wife, if you'll hate me for saying that, uh, and, and sort of give them a couple of hours and say they they go on the ventilator unit, and so they were never used. I and mean, there was a tokenism; they put a few patients to recover in there, and then closed it down. And but it must have cost a billion pounds at least for the building that system. And you know, I remember seeing a brigadier in full camouflage kit, you know, with a stick. Um, pointing out what, how they were building this and doing it. It's so easy to do that, as long as you've got money. It's so easy to create things. It's much more difficult to run them because, you know, in healthcare, it's staff, it's always the problem. And uh, not really doctors. It's, it's um, it, who's going to be there all the time, healthcare assistants you need, people that know how to do things. And that wasn't thought through. So my second question then is the other side, which is, and it's a very sad question, but we obviously understand from what you're saying that there will be a backlog of cancer patients, many of whom have not been diagnosed yet, many of whom, and we know people like this, and we get messages every day, as I'm sure you do, by God, I'm sure you do, for people whose cancer went from being a small lump that was easily curable to full stage four, incurable, inoperable, deadly cancer. What will be the cost, do you think, of, of all of this in terms of cancer deaths? But also, of course, you then have to, heart disease and all of that. But just what, what, the, the thing that I, I've never understood, and I've, I've said this to people, every journalist I know, I said, why are you not asking the politicians how many people die from lockdown? Why have we never had that conversation? What, what, what is your take on that whole thing? Well, I kept trying during the, 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 the height of lockdown to convince people we've got to get the cancer patients out, we've got to get the heart attack people and the stroke people fast-tracked into hospital. And if you're waiting for your hip to be replaced, you can wait. But if you've got cancer, you can't. And the story of cancer is very straightforward. You know, the four common cancers are lung, breast, colon, and prostate. And if you've got a stage one cancer, which means the cancer is confined to the organ, it can usually be cured with either surgery or radiotherapy or both. And uh, the chances of cure are 90% for stage one cancer. Once it starts spreading to the lymph nodes and then beyond the lymph nodes to stage two, three, and then four, more widespread to the lung, to the liver, and so on, the chances drop to less than 10% chance of cure. So you go from 90% cure to 10% cure. The time it takes to get there is very variable, depending on the speed of growth of the cancer, the type of cancer, and so on. But a rough rule is that three months probably drops your stage. In other words, you, and six months drops you two stages. So you go from what the lawyers love to do for case of litigation cases of delay, on the balance of probability, you would survive your cancer if it's 90% right. or if it's stage one, to the balance of probability you're going to die from your cancer if it's stage three or four. So you drop that within three to six months. And uh, that was the problem. Now, we won't really know until another couple of years goes by, so by 2023 and so on, uh, when we look back at the cancer survival and we'll see a, 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 a blip in the patients that presented during lockdown because they couldn't access care. 
Uh, just in the same way, we'll see it for people that have heart attacks. There was a, uh, and a lot of people, it's not just the services weren't there. They were too scared to go to hospitals. So they sat at home with chest pain or they sat at home coughing up blood because they were too scared to use the health service. Also, they were psychologically sort of corrupted, if you like, by the slogans, protect the NHS, stay home, save lives. So your life's not important. You're staying at home to protect other lives. And that was the, you know, it's very clever. Again, these smart guys in number 10 came up with that. And there are always three little slogans in, in the strap line. And uh, very powerful messaging. And what we see now, now we're coming out, is that people are still psychologically brainwashed into the old thinking. Doesn't the government need to take responsibility for that though? If you've got someone literally at home dying of a heart attack and they're too terrified to come in because they're worried about COVID, because the government has given them a disproportionate fear. It, it, it's basic common sense that, you know, that a heart attack is far more dangerous than COVID. It is, but you know, if you've convinced people to stay home and protect the NHS, the, the threshold at which they'll call for help is raised considerably. And that's been the problem, whether it's cancer or heart attack or stroke, the, the threshold has changed. And so we've got to get it back. We've got to get people back into the system. But that's going to take a lot of convincing. If you've essentially given them a diet of fear, a propaganda of fear for 18 months, how do you undo that? And people are so fearful. I mean, yeah. again, it's back to the mask wearing on the train the, yeah. and, and, and people are avoiding me because I haven't got a mask and, and you know, this sort of thing. They're, they're still very scared. And these people are double vaccinated, you know, uh, and uh, yet they're, they're still so scared. We've got to remove that and sort of embrace it like we embrace the flu. We just live with it. And, you know, someone goes off work for the flu, that's fine. They come back a week later and we get back to work. Uh, but we, we, this is different somehow. This is a, uh, you know, the fear factor is much greater for COVID. Carol, speaking of fear, uh, you, you, you're obviously an optimistic, cheery guy. Francis and I are not. <laughs> um, in, in, you know, in your quiet moments when you, you're just, you've got a minute to yourself, do you ever wonder if we're ever going to get back to normal? I think the population here and in other countries has really been badly hit psychologically. Mm. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take uh, probably two or three years. And even then, will we get back? In other words, will air travel still need PCR tests beforehand mm. and afterwards? This sort of thing. Uh, you know, bureaucracy creates jobs for bureaucrats and they won't want to give up. They want to carry on doing it, just like uh, immigration controls and all the work permits, there's a whole bureaucracy around that. Uh, I can't see it going away very soon. And it's, you're right, it'll, it'll last at least for two years, maybe even longer. Uh, and the fear factor here, I, I bet even after Christmas, people will be still wearing masks on the train because they're scared and they think the mask's going to help. But it's great. It's like having a worry beads, you know, the Arabic nations. <laughs> they all go with worry beads and they play with them. Uh, same thing with a mask. If you want to wear it, why not? So just wrapping up then, do you think we need a public inquiry after this to find out? Not least because we need to know what to do next time. It's not the last pandemic. Uh, interesting. Uh, we do need to do something. We need to have a review. I, I, public inquiry, there's no point using it to find fault with the politicians. Yeah. They're, it's, they're incompetent. You can see they're incompetent. Mm -hmm. I mean, why would a journalist uh, in The Spectator and other journals like that become prime minister? I mean, it makes no sense. <laughs> is that, why is that training to be prime minister? Mm -hmm. And uh, the same for all of them in, in reality. Uh, they're there for, not for their skill set. Uh, and they've got very smart people that advise them, but now and again, it goes wrong. So I think going forward, what we need to do is work out the various bits that went wrong and how we can avoid them if it happens again. And of course, we have to broaden it from SARS. It's got to be any infectious agent. It could be some Ebola, it could be, which is much more serious, lass of fever, anything like that that comes into the country. And uh, how we can protect against it and implement a, a plan. It's, it's a very, very good point because I don't know about you, do you think we're going to enter a stage where we see more pandemics now? 
or do you think it's going to be another? I know it's a it's a ridiculous question almost to ask, but yeah. do you think it, we're going to see? I love the original. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It, it is. But... Just stop asking this stupid question, Francis. <laughs> do you think we're, we're we're going to be seeing more pandemics as we go on? Uh, I, I think the threshold again for pandemic fear yes. is, is is lowered. In other words, as, as soon as if you remember way back. Uh, in 20, 2012, we had the MERS, mm -hmm. and then in 2003 and 2004, we had the SARS, the mm -hmm. first SARS. And it didn't really cause that much disturbance to everybody. No. But now we've all been primed. Well, that's done now. That's never going to happen again. It, it's never right? going to happen again. We're mm -hmm. going to be much harder and stopping, trying to stop with non-pharmacological interventions, the spread of anything new that comes. And we're going to have better monitoring systems so you don't suddenly realise that half your population have been infected. In any pandemic, any infectious agent, there are only three types of people. Those that are actually infected, mm -hmm. those that are susceptible, and those that are immune, either because they've had it or they've been vaccinated. So you've just got three groups of people. And what you want to do is reduce the susceptible group to as small as possible mm -hmm. and increase the other two group. You don't want too many infected, mm -hmm. but you want the immunized people or the, um, the natural immunity people to, to go up. And, and reduce the susceptible. And that's that's got to be the aim. Uh, and a public inquiry, going back to the last question, mm -hmm. could help. It, you know, the public inquiries I've been involved in have just been whitewash. And uh, <laughs> lawyers get in and they're long, they've produced long texts and uh, not much happens. So I think what we need is a, a direction of travel for prevention of a further incident like this ever again. It's a very, very poignant note to end on because I, I think we all agree that we need an investigation because we can't allow the mistakes to be repeated. Carol, thank you so much for coming on. Our final question before we've got a few questions from our local supporters is what's the one thing we're not talking about but we really should be? The thing we're not talking about is still death. I said that the last time you interviewed me. And age. Um, you know, what's the value of life? And is the value of someone of your age greater than the value of someone my age? So uh, that is the thing. At the moment, the health service gives, doesn't use age. It's uh, ageless. But why shouldn't we use age? If you're 85, do you deserve a very high cost cancer drug if you get cancer? If we can afford it, yes, but the priority has to be for the 40-year-old or the 30-year-old to get that drug. And that's something that no one likes to talk about. And, uh, and if I do talk about it, they say, oh, this is a dangerous territory. So why should it be dangerous? We have to make decisions. Carol, thank you so much for coming on. If people want to find you online, where is the best place to do that? The best place is Carol Sikora at hotmail.com. Okay. Oh, you're going to get lots of emails now. <laughs> uh, and, and you're on Twitter, of course, as and well. And I'm on Twitter, Prof. Carol Sikora. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, Carol Sikora, thank you so much for coming back. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you very soon with another brilliant episode like this one or our show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time or 2 p.m. Eastern. Take care and see you soon, guys. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our locals community using the link below.